Vatican postpones the beatification of Venerable Fulton J. Sheen. But why? I'll share new information with you. And a controversial U.S. bishop steps down for his handling of sex abuse cases in his diocese. Author and editor of Catholic World News, Philip Lawler, is here with analysis. And protests continue in Hong Kong against the communist Chinese government, while a major Chinese cardinal condemns the Vatican-China deal. Asia expert and president of the Population Research Institute, Stephen Mosher, will update us. Finally, Broadway actor Ken Jennings tells us all about his New York stage production of The Gospel of John. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. A very important show for you tonight. Philip Lawler, Stephen Mosier, Ken Jennings, and in a moment we'll talk to a member of Venerable Archbishop Sheen's family. She'll react to the news that you've been hearing all week, and we're going to set some things straight here. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. But first, some news from the world over. The Vatican announced the resignation of Buffalo, New York Bishop Richard Malone this week. Malone has been under intense scrutiny for nearly two years for his alleged mishandling of credible accusations of sex abuse by priests in his diocese. Bishop Malone's critics say he ignored valid allegations against priests and failed to relieve offenders of their duties. The Vatican accepted the resignation and gave no explanation for the early retirement. Malone has admitted to mistakes in some abuse cases in Buffalo, but insisted repeatedly he would not step down. Bishop Edward Scharfenberger of Albany has been named apostolic administrator until a new bishop is chosen. The eight Catholic dioceses in New York have been hit with over 500 lawsuits in the wake of a recent state law allowing victims one year to sue over abuse that occurred outside the statute of limitations. All of this is curiously related to our next story, and one of the big stories of the week, a bombshell revelation that has shocked the faithful. The 21st of December beatification of Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen has been indefinitely postponed. The Diocese of Peoria, in a statement, said, quote, with deep regret, Bishop Daniel Janke of Peoria announces that he has been informed by the Holy See that the beatification of Fulton Sheen will be postponed. Bishop Jenke is deeply saddened by the decision. Bishop Jenke is even more concerned for the many faithful who are devoted to Sheen and who will be afflicted by this news. So far, the Vatican has given no reason for the delay, but the Diocese of Peoria cited several U.S. bishops who requested further consideration of the cause. According to reports, Bishop Salvatore Matano of Rochester demanded that the cause be re-examined and delayed for fear that Sheen might be mentioned in the pending New York Attorney General's report on dioceses and their handling of sex abuse in the state. The Diocese of Peoria explicitly said the postponement was not due to any allegations related to sexual abuse by Sheen himself. Now, I've been working this story all week, and I have some new information to share with you exclusively. After years of delay and wrangling over the body of Bishop Sheen, which included lawsuits and a battle between Sheen's family and the Archdiocese of New York, his remains were finally released to Peoria by court order this past summer. What I learned this week from highly placed sources at the Vatican in New York and in Peoria is that in late June of last year, once the court order demanded that Sheen's body be moved to Peoria, Bishop Matano of Rochester suddenly produced new documents concerning Sheen's handling of abusers in the Rochester Diocese between 1966 and 1969. According to Monsignor James Cruz of Peoria, he and a lawyer, along with multiple Vatican offices, examined those documents, which concerned two priests and cleared Sheen of any wrongdoing. I am told by my Vatican sources that the Secretary of State and the Congregation for Saints did their own investigations and declared that there was no obstacles to the cause proceeding. Now, that's when they sent official notification to Peoria that the beatification would proceed 
and offered the date of December 21st for the formal beatification. This is where things get interesting. Why delay a cause that has been thoroughly vetted by multiple congregations? Well, we can't say for certain, but the timeline might furnish some answers. When Rome sent word that the beatification was moving forward, Bishop Matano of Rochester fired off a blistering letter to the Vatican, asking the cause to be delayed, citing the Attorney General's report. Cardinal Timothy Dolan of New York and Blaise Supich of Chicago were copied on that letter. I am told, again, by multiple Vatican sources, that it was Dolan and Supich who went to the very highest offices in Rome to press for the delay of the cause. Out of an overabundance of caution, Rome agreed to their request. In Shane's biography, or autobiography, rather, Treasure in Clay, he alludes to, quote, trials inside and outside the church. What he didn't share was the story of his relationship with Cardinal Francis Spellman of New York, the man responsible in the late 50s for removing Sheen from TV and icing him out of speaking in his own diocese. Now, he did this because Sheen refused to use money for the missions, money that Sheen controlled to pay Spellman millions of dollars for free milk donated to the diocese by the government. Sheen's integrity cost him a lot. Spellman's was a cruel, petty act driven by ego and envy. And apparently, even in death, Sheen is still being victimized for his good works. He was a master evangelist. He reached tens of millions of people a week who used his platform to convert thousands and thousands of people. And sometimes when you're in the public eye, envy is stoked. There is no answer or explanation for jealousy. The point here is, Sheen is blameless. In fact, in the two cases that Rochester produced on those documents, the two cases that were studied in Rome demonstrate that Sheen did what other bishops in the 60s and 70s and even today should have done. He refused to allow an abuser to return to ministry. Father Gerard Gouley, who was charged with abuse in Rochester, asked Sheen back in the late 70s to be reassigned after his abuse was discovered. Sheen refused, and according to Monsignor Cruz in Peoria, during his administration, he never put children in harm's way. But regardless of the facts, the Bishop of Rochester, aided by Cardinal Dolan and Cardinal Supich, pressed for this delay until the New York Attorney General report is issued, for fear that Sheen might be mentioned there. So let me get this straight. The Catholic Church is now relegating a beatification to civil authorities, even after it has conducted its own investigation. With all due respect, if you live by the Attorney General, you will die by him. I only hope when the New York Attorney General files his report, other bishops come out with as clean a record as Archbishop Sheen. There's been a lot of outlandish reporting surrounding this case this week. Some suggested Sheen shielded abusers. Other referred to a 2007 court case that mentioned Sheen walking in on a co-worker at the Society for the Propagation of Faith. That story has already been thoroughly vetted and dismissed. It was dismissed years ago. What I've given you are the facts as we've gathered them this week. In a nutshell, it seems like another clerical roadblock to this cause, driven by heaven knows what. My question is this, after two decades of investigation and interviews and vetting of these very documents from Rochester, why delay the beatification? Allow it to proceed and raise any subsequent questions during the canonization process. There is another round to this. This is a tragedy for the church and those who looked forward to the advancement of Sheen's cause. The faithful are scandalized. The Vatican should clear this up quickly and allow the cause to proceed. All week long, I kept thinking of something Archbishop Sheen once said. Jealousy is the tribute mediocrity pays to genius. I guess this is all a tribute, if a rather ugly one. Joining me now via telephone is a beloved member of Archbishop Sheen's family. She grew up knowing the Archbishop, his cousin, Rosemary Costello. Thank you for being with us, Rose. What was your reaction and the family's when you heard of this postponement of the cause? Well, it's uh, quite
quite frankly, it was shock at first. I, I'm kind of likening it to uh, the stages of, uh, of grief, where you're shocked and angry and sad and everything. Um, it's, it has not been a good week. Hmm. You, your grandmother and Archbishop Sheen were cousins, and I know he was part of your family growing up. What was your relationship with him like? Well, um, I was lucky enough. I'm the oldest of uh, my family of six children, and the bishop baptized myself and my siblings, gave us our sacraments since I was the oldest. Hmm. Um, I do remember him very well, and I was a freshman in college when he died in 1979, so I do have very fond memories of him. Wow. You're asking for masses to be said uh, worldwide on Monday, December 9th. That is the 40th anniversary of Archbishop Sheen's death. What do you hope will yes, be achieved is. there? Well, I mean, um, never underestimate the power of prayer, and our holy masses are our highest form of prayer in the Catholic Church. And um, we have done this before when there was one of our pauses in the cause, if you will, mm -hmm. and um, we had masses said worldwide, which had a wonderful effect. And um, so we just want to rally everyone, everyone who loves Bishop Sheen, and to remember him on on this special anniversary, and but also in light of what's going on right now, uh, we need all the prayers we can get. Perfect. Well, thank you for joining us, Rose, and uh, our prayers are certainly with you and the family. And uh, we're all joining in prayer that the cause of Venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen proceeds as it should. Thank you. Well, I am, I am counting on that. Thank you. Now, here now to discuss all of this and much more is the editor of Catholic World News, a fellow at Thomas More College, Philip Lawler, who joins us from New Hampshire. Phil, thanks for being with us. Now, given, Phil, that this cause has been ongoing since 2002, it seems the bishops who are now raising objection, they had 17 years to do so. And the, the, the documents that they're citing, the concerns they have, have already been fully investigated by the Vatican. Is this a legitimate holdup in your mind? I doubt it. I mean, I don't have all the facts, but it certainly doesn't look like a legitimate holdup. It, it looks more like... Uh, an effort to, well, to rain on the parade. Mm. And what was included in the statement from the Diocese of Peoria really rings true to me that a beatification should be a time of rejoicing, a time of mm. celebration. And we now, thanks to our bishops, have made it into a time of controversy and cynicism. Mm. It's, mm. it's one more disgrace in the lap of the American hierarchy. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's pitiful to me because, again, people misunderstand what sainthood is, and, and in this case, a blessed is. All they're saying, all the Vatican is saying, is not that this individual is uh, perfection or a second Jesus. What they're saying is they have heroic virtue and have displayed heroic virtue throughout their lives. That's all the sainthood proclamation uh, uh, insists upon. It is not perfection. So the fact that all of these things have been vetted and there's still another step left in this process is very confusing to me. Why they just wouldn't wait. Do the beatification. You've already gone out. Um, uh, th there was the report, CNA had it in their reporting, that there was concern that politicians might use this and the attorney general in New York to time the release of his report and a mention of Sheen with the beatification. Is, is, is that a real concern? Actually, I think that is a real concern. I think we're in a situation where any time any American Catholic prelate is being honored, whether he's living or dead, there will be some political blowback, and some politicians will use the occasion to get some cheap publicity, even if there isn't any realistic criticism of this prelate. And I have no doubt that that could happen in New York, where it's sort of open season on Catholic bishops these days. Mm -hmm. However, I would also say that if you think you can wait a few months and it will all blow over, you're kidding yourself. Mm -hmm. I don't foresee any time in the near future when the situation will be much different. So nope. a small postponement probably won't change very much. No, I agree. And I, I, I mean, you mentioned, you know, it's open season on bishops. Well, some of them are guilty, we have to say, Phil. I mean, uh, you know, Malone just re retired early. Of it course. wasn't because, you know, he didn't like the way the cathedra fit. He, he retired because of ongoing scandals and reports and assistants coming out and blowing the whistle on him and recordings. I mean, it was, it, it was an embarrassment. So the Sheen thing just, uh, it, it strikes me as a moment of grace in the midst of this chaos, a moment of faith that the, the, the faithful, the few left, were clinging to. 
And to take this occasion away from them, it, it, it seems it robs them of joy in the midst of the Christmas uh, lead up and the midst of Advent. Well, I, 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 just, I do agree with you, but I'd add another point, which is it would have been a great moment of grace, a great encouragement for the faithful if they had gone through with the beatification ceremony. Mm -hmm. And if a politician tried to cast some aspersions on the memory of Archbishop Sheen, mm -hmm. you had Cardinal Dolan and Bishop Matano and others come to his defense enthusiastically and energetically and, and really mm -hmm. you know, take the case to the public rather right. than sort of cowering in the background. Yeah. Well, we saw this with uh, Junipero Serra. We saw it with John Paul II. There are always people who try to capitalize on these big moments because they're meaningful, they're important, and the eyes of the world are looking at these individuals in the church. But to allow civil authorities to set the timetable for beatification seems to me wrongheaded. But I, I guess these bishops are going to be dancing with the attorney general for a long time. I guess now we're also giving them authority over beatifications. Maybe confirmations next. I, I don't know what's going on. Um, I, I want to move to another big story this week, Phil. Pope Francis accepted the resignation of Bishop Richard Malone, whom I referenced a moment ago, in Buffalo. Now, his resignation comes after scandals and the leaked documents I referred to, uh, claims that he covered up sexual abuse. What took so long in this case? Why was the Vatican so slow to respond to these charges? I have no idea. The Vatican has not been very quick to respond to charges of this sort in dozens of cases at this point. And even now, the Vatican isn't playing by its own rules. It didn't do an investigation of, of Bishop Malone under the provisions of the document the Pope just put out last year. It did an investigation of the diocese. Now, what came up in that investigation? We don't know. We're mm -hmm. not told. Mm -hmm. We're told that the bishop resigned of his own volition after he had seen the results of the investigation. Well, you and I know that when he saw the results of the investigation, he probably was given a pretty clear indication of what Rome wanted of him. Yeah. And what Rome wanted was the, his resignation. Hmm. He was in Rome just a few weeks ago for it his was. ad limina visit. And he was asked if it was true that he had resigned, and he said it absolutely false. Now he discloses that, in fact, he had resigned. So uh, the public statements are really uh, not giving us credit for much intelligence. Hmm. We, we don't know what happened. We do know that there's not the level of candor and accountability that we've been promised year after year. It's just not happening. Mm. As you mentioned, there was that October visitation. What is the public owed, Phil? I mean, given the public nature of so much of this story in Buffalo, with the assistant going on 60 minutes and the document drop, and then the, 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 the secretary recording the bishop, to dismissing cases and kind of poo-pooing them, all of that was such a public scandal. Is the public owed something, particularly in that diocese from the church? Yes, I think the public is owed an accounting. We don't have to know every gory detail, but I think we have to have an honest accounting for what happened and why. In most institutions, if a leader is forced out because of misfeasance or malfeasance, uh, at least there is some accountability, at least there's some indication given that he didn't go of his own volition. Mm -hmm. And at least his successor will come in and say he's going to clean house. It, mm -hmm. In that respect, it was a huge breakthrough, I thought, in Wheeling, Charleston, where you had a bishop for the mm -hmm. first time in my memory openly criticize his predecessor by name. I can't think of another occasion when that's happened. No. No. Uh, Albany's Bishop Edward Scharfenberger will serve as the apostolic administrator in Buffalo until a new bishop is appointed. Now, he said he plans to visit the diocese weekly, and when asked about how he would handle an allegation of abuse, he said this. Immediately. Immediately. I would first of all say, tell the police right away. And then they will follow the normal procedures that we do. And the appropriate thing that's usually done in the case when an allegation like that comes in is that you uh, inform the priest and then you uh, put him on administrative leave. And then you take appropriate steps after that. Now, this is a response we've heard before, Phil, um, from other bishops. Uh, what needs to be done in Buffalo to restore confidence in your mind? The first thing that needs to be done is just what I said before 
clarity and honesty. One of the things that I've been saying for about 15 years now is the way you restore trust, the way the American bishops can restore trust, is by making some public statements against their own interests. That mm. is, admitting to something that they don't yet have to admit because it's already in the headlines. Admitting to something, you know, breaking the stories themselves. When you say something that's negative about yourself, that increases your own credibility. When you admit your own failings, mm -hmm. that increases your own credibility. Mm -hmm. When they're dragged out by the media or by attorney general or by investigation, that just hampers your own credibility. And mm -hmm. that's what's been happening for, for 20 years now. Sad. Yeah. Well, this Sheen situation, it seems he's been drafted in. You know, it's almost a form of presentism where you judge the past by the present. But he's been drafted in to the, the woes of the current bishops of New York. The state of New York, along with 15 other states, have new rules that now extend or suspend the statute of limitations. Now, this allows claims of abuse stretching back decades. The Diocese of Rochester has already filed for bankruptcy, and the Diocese of Buffalo has been named in more than 220 recent lawsuits. They've already paid out 18 million to more than 100 victims under a compensation plan. Now, this is just the beginning, Phil. How bad is this going to get? And how do you think it's going to affect the church in the United States and the credibility of the bishops? Well, the credibility of the bishops can't get much worse than it is now, honestly. I, d I don't mean to be cynical, but as, as I said earlier, we're in a situation where even a beatification mm. is an opportunity for people to, uh, you know, to pour some more vitriol at, at the hierarchy. Mm. Um, I think it's going to get worse financially. I think you'll have more bankruptcies. You'll have more schools and parishes closed. And I think it will be, in the end, a great purification because too often the money is caught up in scandals. And just right. by the way, uh, you mentioned that Archbishop Sheen is caught up in this. As I understand it, if you look at the record with a fine-tooth comb, you'll find that when he was a bishop in Rochester, mm -hmm. uh, he actually did a very good job right. of handling abuse cases, that, that it's been thoroughly investigated, that he did what a lot of other bishops should have done. Right. So oh, I if that uh, the record were thoroughly exposed, he would look better. Mm -hmm. No, it's, 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 again, I, I worry about trying to drag a, a, a figure from the past into the present and judge him by present standards. But even with that, even at that bar, Sheen passes, which is rather extraordinary considering all those around him at the time and what they did and other causes that have been rescinded because of questions uh, related to this. I just think it's a bad idea for the church to go down this path of saying, we're going to wait for attorneys generals to clear us and then we'll move forward with canonization. Because if that's the new standard, there are a number of popes I can think of and bishops who probably, they may want to rescind those sainthoods and rescind the beatifications because because their records might not be pure in this area. Just saying. Uh, let's move on to something else, Phil, before I run out of time. Uh, as you know, the House of Representatives is moving toward an impeachment of President Trump. Speaker Pelosi today said she is ordering articles of impeachment to be drafted. Uh, this is a bit of her press conference when James Rosen of Sinclair asked her if she hates the president, and that might be driving this effort. Watch what she said. Do you hate the president, Madam Speaker? Because I don't, Representative I don't Cohen, hate anybody. Representative I don't Cohen, have a great uh, reason I am. House, we don't hate anybody, not anybody in the world. So don't, don't accuse me. I did not accuse you. And as a Catholic, I resent your using the word hate in a sentence that addresses me. I don't hate anyone. I was raised in a way that is full, a heart full of love and always prayed for the president. And I still pray for the president. I pray for the president all the time. So don't mess with me when it comes to words like that. Your thoughts about wrapping this impeachment push in a religious garb. It's not out of character for the speaker. Nancy Pelosi has wrapped herself in the Catholic faith when it's convenient for her over the whole course of her political career. And it's disgraceful given how little attention she, pl she pays to the teachings of the church when it comes to key moral issues involving the right to life, uh, involving the nature of marriage, 
on those issues she ignores and flouts the teachings of the church. Then when it's to her political advantage, she wraps herself in the faith. Uh, she should be called on it. Hmm. We'll leave it there. Phil Aller, thank you for your insight, your commentary, which can be found at catholicculture.org. And your most recent book, The Smoke of Satan, is available at bookstores everywhere. Stephen Mosier is up next, but first, more news. The U.S. House of Representatives passed legislation this week calling for a strong response against China's treatment of Uyghur Muslims. By an overwhelming vote, the House approved a bill requiring the administration to toughen its response to China's crackdown on this religious minority. U.N. experts say China's detaining up to a million Uyghurs in mass concentration camps. The bill now goes to the Senate for consideration before Trump can sign it into law. More on this in our next segment. Joining me now with an update on what's really happening in mainland China is the president of the Population Research Institute and author of Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the Threat to World Order. Please welcome Steve Mosier from Florida. Steve, thanks for being here. The protests in Hong Kong continue, even All after right. the elections and support from the U.S. Now, you wrote a piece in Breitbart saying that the people of Hong Kong will continue to demand democracy and they'll push against the current leadership, Carrie Lam. Uh, these protests have lasted six months. They've hurt tourism. They've led to the Hong Kong stock market diving, and some have lost their job. Given all of this, can the people of Hong Kong continue this protest? Will they continue? Well, I think they, I think they will. I think they were promised uh, local democracy as kind of their birthright, something they inherited uh, from the Sino-British Agreement signed way back in 1984. Mm -hmm. The Chinese government, what I call the China Party State, the Communist Party State, has torn up the Sino-British Agreement. It tore it up two years ago. By now, the local legislature, Raymond, should be entirely democratically elected. It's not. Mm. And so the Hong Kong Chinese went out and voted, two million of them, 70% uh, of the voting population voted and overturned the communist Chinese control of 17 of the 18 local district councils. This was like in a presidential contest, uh, one candidate winning 48-49 winning of the 50 states. It was mm. a devastating blow to the prestige of the Chinese Communist Party. And I don't mm. think it ends here. I think it begins here. It begins with all of those district councils passing resolutions calling for the resignation of the Hong Kong governor, calling for the Chinese Communist Party to step back and allow local autonomy, uh, calling for the Chinese Communist Party to withdraw its garrison in Hong Kong. I think, I think this is the first chapter of a long book. And what may happen, what may happen is the democratic aspiration of the people in Hong Kong may spread across the border to China. Ah. We may start seeing copycat demonstrations in Guangzhou and Shanghai and Beijing. Uh, this is a real wake-up call for the Chinese Communist Party. They thought they had Hong Kong in the bag. Uh, they were told by Hong Kong's leaders that the silent majority in Hong Kong opposed the demonstrators. Well, guess what? The silent majority came out and voted, and they voted overwhelmingly to support the young mm. demonstrators. Now, uh, the, the House passed and the president signed this Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. Xi Jinping cannot be happy with that. No, but the people of Hong Kong are very happy. They're waving American flags, singing America the Beautiful, and actually uh, carrying posters with pictures of Donald Trump on it. So we're, we're, we're very, very uh, proud as Americans to stand on the side of freedom and democracy anywhere. And we should be standing with the people of Hong Kong. Uh, they were promised local free elections. They should have those elections. Mm -hmm. What happens now is that if China moves into Hong Kong, and takes control of Hong Kong directly and uses, for example, force to end the demonstrations. We have another Tiananmen massacre. Hong Kong loses its special status. It stops being treated as a de facto separate country, and it becomes part of China. Two trillion dollars disappear overnight. Hong Kong stops being the major financial hub, the major financial center in East and Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. The economic blow of that to China itself would be tremendous. Yeah. And the Chinese leaders who have a lot of their ill-gotten gains stashed in Hong Kong in investments there would lose big time. Wow. Uh, this is all tied to trade. I mean, you referenced it there a moment ago. On Tuesday during his meeting with the Secretary General of NATO, President Trump was asked when a deal with China might take place. He said this. In some ways, I like the idea of waiting till after the election. 
for the China deal. But they want to make a deal now, and we'll see whether or not the deal is going to be right. It's got to be right. Look, China has been ripping off the United States for many, many years. Mm. Is he smart to delay? Is he smart to delay a deal? Well, let, let's let's back up a little bit here and 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 tell tell what really happened this year, which was that in late March the Chinese government backed away from a 150-page single-space trade deal that had been negotiated over the previous year. Right. They tore it up. And they did so because, I believe, because a week later, um, Joe Biden announced that he was running for president, and the Chinese Communist Party thought, oh, Joe's our friend. We're in business mm -hmm. with Hunter mm -hmm. Biden. Let's now wait out Donald Trump and mm. we'll wait for President Biden to take office and then we'll get much better terms. Right. So they walked away from the trade deal uh, and now they're back to the negotiating table. But I don't believe, Raymond, that they're negotiating in good faith. They're stalling. There are no high-level uh, delegations coming over to the United States. I think that President Trump has figured out uh, the obvious, which is that they're trying to wait him out. They're hoping he won't be reelected in 2020, and they'll get someone in office that uh, is is willing to compromise, is willing to go back to the old status quo, which was that China gets to rip us off and and we don't retaliate in any way. China gets to steal our intellectual property and cheat on trade, and and we simply well, let ourselves be taken well, advantage th of. That economy's so, in trouble. I, their economy's uh, in trouble. Trump which has is said another it, reason they're probably coming back to the table. Their their economies. Yeah, their economy's in, in really bad shape. Supply chains are relocating to other countries. Uh, their, their exports are down. Uh, their economic growth is slowing, maybe in negative territory now. We don't know. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you know, the American economy is the envy of the world, and the Chinese economy is, is going in the tank. So time is on our side. And, and I think the president's made it clear that if the China doesn't come to the negotiating table quickly, he'll wait until after the election and get even better terms for the United States for mm. American workers. So yeah. um, mm. I, I like that strategy. Now, moving on to religious freedom and human rights in China, there have been several leaked reports of these detention centers uh, throughout China. And, and Beijing claims these are vocational training centers. They are, in fact, heavily fortified re-education camps designed to turn Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities into good Chinese citizens who speak Mandarin. Your notions and, and insight on these reports, and what haven't we heard? Well, what haven't we heard is that... Uh we now have 400 pages, roughly, of documents describing how the concentration camps, I mean, re-education camps, yes, but they have, um, you know, hot high walls and, and watchtowers in the corners and guards everywhere. Surveillance cameras are set up so there is not a single blind spot inside the entire prison. So people are, wa are watched when they're going to the bathroom. They're watched when they're in the shower. Um, everybody is under very, very tight control. And the goal of this, uh, network of concentration camps, uh, several hundred in fact, that we've identified by satellite, is to turn the, the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs of western China, what we call western Turkestan, Xinjiang right. in Chinese, into good Chinese, Han Chinese speaking citizens. That means they're required to give up their religious faith. They're not allowed to believe in God. They have to believe in Xi Jinping. Uh, the, the church that they're supposed to be worshiping in is the Church of China. Uh, not, 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 not the church of their religious faith. They're punished if they speak uh, Uyghur or Kazakh. They must learn to speak fluent Chinese as a condition of being released. Mm. So there are a minimum of one million people in these camps. The camps are hold an average of 5,000 people. Uh, there are 400 we've identified by satellite. So do the, you know, if we do the math, that's, that's, they can hold up to two million uh, and they may be overcrowded. So many of the Uyghur men uh, in their 20s, 30s, 40s, have been taken out of their families and put in these concentration camps. They will not be released ever unless they learn to speak fluent Chinese, quote the sayings of Xi Jinping, and give up their faith. They're forced on Muslim holy days to drink uh, alcohol and eat pork, for example. Wow. So it's, it's brutal mistreatment. It's a form of cultural genocide. But let's not forget what happens to the women and children when the men are in prison, because the Chinese police who are in Western Turkestan in huge numbers are being billeted with the women and children. Oh. And in fact, they say that the, the, the policemen uh, are, are sleeping in the same beds with the women, but they keep a, a distance of three feet between themselves and the women. Mm. Well, um, you know, believe that if you will. Yeah. But 
this is this is worse than cultural genocide. Um, it's it's the devastation of an entire people. Uh, Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party simply want to eliminate the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs uh, from the face of the earth. Now, there are some people in the concentration camps who will never leave because either they refuse to give up their religion or they're sacrificed, they're executed. Hmm. Uh, we know that most of the organs that are used in forced organ transplantation in China come from Western Turkestan. We know that in the airports in Western Turkestan, there are express lanes for the doctors who are carrying out the harvested lungs and kidneys hmm. and hearts uh, through the airport security lines onto the plane to get them to hospitals where they can be transplanted. Uh, this is forced organ transplantation. It's big business in China. And don't forget, everybody in Western Turkestan, 20, 25, 30 million people have had their DNA collected and their DNA has been analyzed so they can find out in an instant who's a tissue match for someone in Shanghai Awful. or Beijing willing to pay big bucks wicked. for, say, a heart or a liver. Wicked, wicked stuff. I, I want to turn for a moment, I only have about three minutes, Steve, to the Catholic Church in China. Uh, as we know, there was this Vatican-China deal signed in September of 2018. Details are still on known. Now, prior to the signing of the agreement, Pope Francis reportedly asked Bishop Vincent Gao, who was recognized by the Vatican and a member of the underground church, to sacrifice his position in the order, uh, in order, rather, to formally excommunicate Bishop Zahn so that this bishop could take his place. This was an effort to promote unity. Gao agreed and stepped down to become Zahn's auxiliary. Now Bishop Gao's on the run. What happened? Well, what happened is the diocese was turned upside down. Uh, originally, there were 80, 90,000 people in the underground church and about 10,000 in the patriotic church. Bishop Gua, in obedience to Pope Francis, stepped down, agreed to become the auxiliary. But then the Con Communist Party officials came to him and said, that's not enough. You have to sign an agreement acknowledging that you're a member of the Chinese mm. Patriotic Catholic Church. And that he refused to do because the Catholic Patriotic Church in China is a schismatic organization that takes direction not from the magisterium but from the Chinese Communist Party. They've been persecuting this poor man for a year and he's now on the run. He managed to escape his captors but uh, who knows how long he can stay underground. But there's, there's a heartbreaking statement that he made that, that people need to hear. Mm -hmm. Bishop Gua said, before the signing of the agreement we remain fearless and maintain the faith no matter how much we were persecuted because the Holy See supported us. Now, he said, we're really helpless. To be frank, um, whoever refuses to sign the agreement will suffer greater persecution from the Chinese Communist Party. It's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Retired Hong Kong Cardinal Joseph Zen, who's obviously been very vocal about his disapproval of this Vatican-China agreement, uh, in an interview this week, he said of the, of the Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Perolin, who authored the Chinese-Vatican agreement, it's a real mystery how a man of the church, given all his knowledge of China, of the communists, could do such a thing as he's doing now. The only explanation is not faith. It's a diplomatic success, vainglory. Of Pope Francis's approach to China, he says that he has low respect for his predecessors. He's shutting down everything done by John Paul II and Pope Benedict. Your reaction, Steve Mosier? Well, I think Bishop Zen, who knows China better than anyone else because he's one of only two Chinese cardinals, three Chinese cardinals in the whole world, uh, should have been consulted before the Sino Vatican agreement was signed, uh, he, and his advice should have been followed. And the pastoral guidelines that were issued last June are a disaster mm -hmm. because they're unsigned. No one knows who wrote them, although we think they were brought up to Cardinal Perlin. And they basically tell Chinese priests and, and Chinese bishops, like good Bishop Gua that we were just talking about, uh, if they come to you and want you to sign an agreement joining the Patriotic Church, uh, call in witnesses and say to witnesses that you're signing under protest. Well, that won't be allowed. Mm. And the pastoral guidelines then say, well, if they don't allow you to call in witnesses, write an addendum on the bottom of the official document saying you disagree with the provision of joining the, the patriotic church. That won't be allowed either. The guidelines are totally useless in mm. dealing with the real situation in China. Now, now, Raymond, I don't understand why. If the Vatican wanted the 
Chinese Catholics who've been faithful members of the church for decades and suffered persecution mm -hmm. to join the Patriotic Church. Why not just issue a general dispensation saying, uh, we understand that you're under tremendous pressure and right. persecution. Go ahead and sign the agreement, make a mental reservation. You have a general dispensation to do that. But these guidelines don't do that. These guidelines are so vague and confusing that people like Bishop Guo really don't know what to do. Uh, a, a Chinese bishop has come out and said that Catholics in the country must put their loyalty to the state before the faith. Bishop John Fang Xiao uh, had this to say at a communist-sponsored meeting last week. He said, love of homeland must be greater than the love for the church, and the law of the country is above canon law. Why are we not hearing, hearing anything from the Vatican, uh, uh, given this rhetoric, Steve? Well, this turns, uh, you know, the faith on its head, doesn't it? Because we're to be, we're to be faithful to God first, and and then to be be good Americans or good Chinese second. Mm -hmm. um, but this has been said by by many of the patriotic bishops. Bishop Fang, mm -hmm. another bishop in China, who's a member of the Patriotic Church and also a member of the National People's Congress, so he's on very good right. terms with the Communist Party, has said exactly the same thing. We are to be good Chinese first. We are to be good socialists first, and then we can be Catholic. Well, that's not that's not the proper order no. of things, is it? Well, we will leave it there. Stephen Mosher, thank you for your insight as always, and we look forward to having you again. Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the New Threat to the World Order by Stephen Mosher is available at bookstores everywhere and online. Thank you again. Finally tonight, he's best known for his musical roles on Broadway, but just in time for the Christmas season, my next guest will soon star in a solo stage version of one of the Gospels. The one-man play, The Gospel of John, opens in New York City at the Sheen Center on December 8th. Here to tell us all about it is the star of the show, veteran stage actor Ken Jennings, who joins us from Manhattan. Ken, a delight to have you on the program. Nice to be here, Raymond. Now, one of the roles you're probably best known for, for the one I first saw you in, was your second Broadway role, Toby in Sweeney Todd, a role you originated. Of course, you introduced the great number, uh, Not While I'm Around. Uh, this was early in your career. I know Sweeney was 1979. How did you get the role? Oh, just the normal way my agent submitted me for the, uh, for the audition, and I went. And uh, mm. I don't think I even read. I think I just sang one song for them. Wow. It was on a Broadway stage, so they were sitting out in the house. I didn't even know it was there. I probably sang Danny Boy, because that's huh. what I was using a lot for those auditions in those days. So, huh. um, and then I called, and, uh, and they said I had the show. Wow. Now, you worked with Angela Lansbury. You went on tour later with the production and the legendary director-producer Hal Prince. What did they teach you? What did you learn at that young age about this profession, uh, about professionalism? Well, that was my first long run. I had mm -hmm. never done a long run before. After that, I've, I did a Grand Hotel in Urinetown, and they, they ran even longer. Wow. Sweeney ran a year and four months on Broadway and then a year on the road. Mm -hmm. What I learned most from that um, was, it's going to sound very, um, a little arcane, perhaps, Raymond. Um, I, I learned how to handle the vicissitudes of a long run. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Is that rough on an actor you when you do hundreds upon hundreds of performances, mm. eight shows a week, week after week? That presents unique challenges to an actor. Yeah. And I had never faced that ever before. Mm. Tell me about that rehearsal. There's that famous story when the bridge uh, behind you fell. What happened? Yes, we were actually in preview performances, and it was about the... Um, it, we were very early in previews, and that huge bridge, uh, mm -hmm. oh, it must have weighed a ton or more. Um, uh, they said, you know, it, it certainly collapsed, and Angela and Len, as far as I know, had just passed underneath it. Wow. And then it just fell to the floor. Now, I wasn't on stage then. Uh, yeah. Tobias is already hiding in the basement. Right. But I do remember um, a friend, I have not seen her in years, Mary Pat Green, apparently, uh, one of the actresses in the show. She um, said, 
I, I heard she said to the rest of the ensemble, let's try to push it out of the way. <laughs> and now, of course, it was impossible to do so. Wow. Because, but, you know, they were, <laughs> the cast was trying to come through, you know. Wow. Um, yes, and then I think uh, after that, then uh, Angela's next line, I think, after that, after they, they I think we continued, and Angela's next line was when she uh, sang, nothing's going to harm you, which, of course, got a big <laughs> laugh from the audience. <laughs> yeah, well, thank God nothing harmed them. Now, you were born, Ken, in Jersey City, New Jersey. You attended Catholic school, Catholic high school and college. How much did the faith influence your life and your work? Now, I missed you on that. I didn't the, hear you. The, the, um, the, you, you. You were born in Jersey City, New Jersey. You attended Catholic school, Catholic high school and college. How much of an influence did that Catholic uh, uh, culture have on your life and your work? Oh, very much so. I mean, one of the reasons I memorized the gospel, a uh, well, uh, very basic reason, but I remember, um, I forget which Jesuit it was, probably in St. Peter's College. It might have been in St. Peter's Prep, though, mm. both uh, Jesuit schools in mm -hmm. Jersey City. I remember the uh, one of the, might have been one of the most important councils of the Jesuits. Yeah. One of the Jesuit priests or one of the scholastics said, no matter what happens in your life, never forget to pray. Mm. So I've always remembered that. Yeah. And uh, that, that simple word of counsel, that has, that has helped me enormously throughout mm. my whole life. And you started reading or carrying that little Bible with you, really, since the days of Sweeney Todd. What prompted you to start reading Scripture and memorizing it? I know it's attached to you were fighting uh, for visitation rights to see your son when you started yes. uh, studying the Gospel of John. Why? Why that Gospel? Well, that gospel, uh, it could have been any scripture. Uh, it was a difficult time. And uh, thinking of what of the Jesuits counsel, never forget to pray. Prayer can always be a good way to handle difficult times. So I thought, well, uh, maybe I'll try to memorize the Gospel of John. Now, of course, that wasn't the only prayer in which I was engaged at that time. Mm -hmm. But I thought, well, maybe I'll try to memorize it. But when one starts a big uh, endeavor like that, one doesn't even know if one's going to reach the end of it, you know? So um, I just started to memorize it as a prayer and was memorizing it very slowly and incrementally uh -huh. because I really had no idea if I was even going to ever complete the task mm -hmm. of memorizing it. But it was because really of the Jesuits' counsel, don't never forget to pray. And since I was going through a difficult time and I thought, well, it's a difficult time. I might as well, uh, this can be part of my prayer life, memorizing mm -hmm. the Gospel of John. And you turned this into a performance. You started performing in churches, and now at the Sheen Center, it's a full-blown performance that you staged, you, you put together. I, I want to give people a little taste of the Gospel of John. Watch. And Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him, and he said, A true Israelite, there's nothing false in him. And Nathaniel answered, How, how do you know me? Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. You believe because I said I saw you under the fig tree. You're going to see greater things. You'll see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Ken, in a recent interview, you said you want to tell this story with emotion and passion, but you purposefully don't present it as an actor. Why not? Yes. Well, um, I thought I was very familiar with Alec McCowan's wonderful performance of the Gospel of Mark. I saw it, I yeah. was also familiar with Dean Jones's one-man show, John on the Isle of Patmos. Mm. And I thought, well, uh, what can I do differently than this? I thought, oh. well, it was all oral tradition, naturally, when, uh, when these stories were first told. Most mm -hmm. of the world could, could neither read nor write. Mm -hmm. So I thought there must have been a time when John was telling this story as he says in his first epistle, what we saw with our eyes, what we touched with our hands, there must have been a time when John was first telling this story in a way that was not theatrical at all. He was basically saying to the listener, 
this is what I saw. Hmm. This is what I experienced. I experienced the resurrection. I saw these things. And so he would not, John himself would not have been an actor. Mm -hmm. Naturally, when we tell stories, we remember things with emotion and passion. So that would come through. Right. But um, John would not have told the story as an actor would tell it because he wasn't an actor. Right. So um, I thought, that's what I will try to do. Mm -hmm. I will try to tell this story perhaps in the way John himself might have first first told it to his listeners. Mm. Now, Ken, you were on stage alone for 90 minutes of this performance of the Gospel of John. How do you keep it fresh every night, and how do you prepare? Well, it, it's it's fairly easier to keep fresh now because uh, don't forget when I used to the Broadway shows the rehearsal uh -huh. periods of Broadway shows they can be very long and very intense so I'm used uh, the Sheen has been wonderful they've given me plenty of rehearsal but for a Broadway show I'd have a lot more rehearsal mm -hmm. and many more preview performances mm -hmm. so right now I still find that I'm discovering the gospel as I play it and mm -hmm. that therefore it's it's right now it's easy to keep fresh because I'm still in the process of discovering it hmm. which is which is really wonderful it's wonderful for me mm -hmm. as even still uh, a present part of my prayer life to continue mm. to continually discover the, this the the new layers of this gospel a, a, as I'm playing it yeah well as someone once said being close and being clever ain't like being true. Thank you for being true, yeah, Ken. True. And I can't wait to see the show, and I would encourage everybody to go see it. The Gospel of John, if you're in New York, conceived and performed by Ken Jennings. It opens December 8th. It runs through December 29th at the Sheen Center in New York City. For more information and showtimes, you can go to sheencenter.org. Ken, thanks for being here. Such an honor. Thank you very much, Raymond. We'll see each other soon. Before we go, the Vatican unveiled its nativity scene, the Christmas tree in St. Peter's Square on Thursday. Now, the large nativity scene is made entirely out of wood. It replicates traditional northern Trentino-style buildings, some 23 life-size wooden figures, all with hand-carved heads, fill the scene. And it represents life in a small rural village in the northern province of Trento in the early 1900s. The scene also features uh, broken tree trunks and limbs salvaged from severe storms in the region in late 2018. About 40 trees will be replanted in the area that have been severely damaged by those hurricane-like winds. The Pope reminded his audience of his recent letter on the meaning and importance of setting up Christmas cribs. He said it's a genuine way to transmit the gospel in a world that sometimes seems to be afraid to remember what Christmas is and erases Christian signs in order to keep only those of a trivial commercial nature. Well, that's all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. You can like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. We also post video links and clips from the show. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.